Brian Lilly, welcome to uh, the, the Nectarine and our live broadcast tonight. Um, look, just before we get into the main meat of everything, people in Victoria are looking to remove Sir John A. statue, and this just came up as I, you know, on my feet as I was waiting to go live, and so the guys didn't know I was going to be talking about this, but. In Victoria, they want to get rid of Sir John A. Macdonald because he's a racist. And this comes up time and time again. Why? Because he had something to do with residential schools. Okay. At the beginning of Black History Month, I asked, and no liberal ever responded to me on this, do we need to dump Sir Wilfrid Laurier for his racist acts? And again, you can find all my details on this at brianlilly.com. I'll tweet it out after we're done here because Sir Wilfrid Laurier was an incredibly racist prime minister. Then, you know, he continued the residential school system that Sir John A. Macdonald had uh, a hand in setting up. But back in 1912, in August of 1912, he actually signed an order in council restricting black immigrants to Canada. Why? Because they were settling the prayer. Sorry, I got a fly dropping through here. I don't know why. Uh, so if you just see me swatting something, it's because I got a fly and it's driving me nuts. August 1912, he signs an order in council restricting black immigrants to Canada. And I want to read part of this uh, to you uh, because it's actually quite shocking uh, what was going on. The country was looking for immigrants to settle the West, and they said... Mm, yeah, but we don't want all these black farmers from Oklahoma. Oklahoma had a lot of free uh, black farmers that were you know, saying, okay, things aren't so great for us here in the United States. We want to come up to Canada. They actually hired agents to go down and say, don't do this. And the order in council said, for a period of one year from and after the date hereof, the landing in Canada shall be, and the same is prohibited of any immigrants belonging to the Negro race, which race is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. Sir Wilfrid Laurier signed this. His signature is on the document. You can find all of this. Um, he also uh, blocked uh, Indian Im immigrants from coming to Canada. He was, um, he exacerbated the ability of Chinese immigrants to come to Canada. Again, I'll tweet all of this out. My apologies to, to Ali, all the guys at uh, the Nectarine for going off on our tangent on this. But it's just bothering me as I'm seeing this, Sir John A must go because he's a racist. Oh, Laurier is on our $5 bill. He's great. He's a liberal. No. Look, we've got to come to terms with our history. And it's not all good and it's not all bad. There's going to be good and there's going to be bad and we've got to figure it out. Anyway, that brings me to our current situation with Saudi Arabia. I'm going to talk about Saudi Arabia and Canada in a very dispassionate way because most of what you're going to be hearing in the Canadian media is somebody pulling on their Team Canada hockey jersey and they're going to cheer for Team Canada. Yeah, screw Saudi. This is awful. Those guys are like, they're, they suck. They're like bad to women. Look. I agree. Saudi Arabia, it's a backward medieval kingdom. Uh, medieval is too nice a word to use to them because in medieval times, at least in in Europe, women were treated, you know, there, there was some respect for women. I'm not saying women had it great, but there was some respect for women. I'm not sure that's there in Saudi Arabia right now. They were just recently granted the right to drive cars. There are still problems with women, there are problems with religious freedom, there's uh, problems with political dissent, all of this. But this spat that we've got going on with Saudi Arabia right now, there's so many problems with it. Look, it started over a tweet. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't liberals been denouncing Donald Trump for doing Twitter diplomacy ever since he was elected? They hate the fact that he does diplomacy through Twitter. They mock him for it. And yet that's what Christia Freeland did. And that's what kicked this off. Christia Freeland, our foreign affairs minister, put out a tweet denouncing the fact that Rafe Badawi, whose wife and children, by the way, live in Canada, live down in Sherbrooke, Quebec, God's country, gorgeous part of the, the country if, you, if you've never been. 
and they're Canadian citizens. They became Canadian citizens earlier this year. They left Saudi Arabia in 2015 because Rafe had been put in prison for criticizing the kingdom, for quote-unquote criticizing Islam, which included saying that Christian Jews and Muslims should live together. That's, that's a horrible crime to be able to say that. Um, but he's been in jails basically since 2012. And Christy Freeland, they put it out, and then it gets picked up by local Arabic media. All of a sudden, people are outraged. Well, what's going to happen? Saudi Arabia is in the middle of a transition right now. This is a kingdom that is backwards, as far as I'm concerned. It's nowhere I'd ever want to live. My brother lived there for a while. Uh, he's one of the people that was kicked out. Uh, and, you know, there's two things I'm very proud of my brother for, other than being my brother. Uh, one is being kicked out of Russia. The other is being kicked out of the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't want an awful lot to do with these guys, but they are powerful players in the Middle East. And let's face it, if we didn't do business with people that are anything but upstanding democracies, we wouldn't be doing business with an awful lot of the world, let's face it. Democracies, liberal democracies, are a rare breed. I wish that it weren't the case. I wish that we didn't put so much stock in the United, uh, United Nations. But we do because of the liberal fetishism of the United Nations. But that place is filled with rogues and dictators, and Saudi Arabia fits into that category. So we've long had dealings with Saudi Arabia. We have, for the last several years, been involved in uh, both business dealings, educational dealings with them. It started, it, you know, it, it's been going on for decades. But let's let's point to the issue that everyone wants to talk about: the light armored vehicles, the labs built in London, Ontario. And these, they're not tanks. Don't call them tanks. That would be wrong. Can they be deadly? Absolutely. But they're light armored vehicles. And they're built in London, Ontario by General Dynamics, a private company that supplies to the American military, to the Canadian military, to other allies. And yes, they were granted an export permit for uh, sending some of these vehicles to Saudi Arabia. Now, I've talked to people that were familiar with the deal, that know the foreign affairs aspects of this. And they said, you know what? Saudi Arabia didn't need these, but what they have decided they want to do is that they want to westernize. They want to change the way things are going. And so when Stephen Harper was still in power, they said, let's get together. Let's talk about this. Let's we'll buy some of these vehicles, but we're going to also spend more money in your country. We're going to send more students to your country. We're going to have more cultural exchanges with your country. And we're going to start doing business. We want to westernize. They've since had this new crown prince take over, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and, and he wants to modernize Saudi Arabia like nobody else. That's great. But it's still backwards. None of us would want to go and live there. But why is, why is Canada picking on Saudi Arabia? I mean, you've got to remember, we are led by a man that says he admires China's basic dictatorship. We are led by a man who loves Iran, which is another awful Middle Eastern dictatorship. You know, there's a kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They're, they're not a dictatorship. Bull crap. They're a dictatorship. They effectively uh, clamp down on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association. For, you know, all the things that we take for granted, they clamp down on. But they are trying to reform. Iran is not. And our current prime minister loves Iran. His brother, Sasha, did a whole documentary with Iranian Press TV. Iranian Press TV is the state broadcaster of Iran. Now, I call CBC the state broadcaster because they are. But let me make this clear. Press TV is the propaganda arm for the Iranian regime. He did a documentary with them and then became a foreign affairs advisor to his brother, both while he was liberal leader and while he was prime minister. So we've got to be worried about their connections to Iran. We've got to be worried about their ties and their love of China. And in the meantime, they're saying, well, no, 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 we've got a uh, values-based foreign policy, and that's why we're criticizing Saudi Arabia. Give me a break. These guys would sell out anyone. Anyway, have you heard what the Trudeaus have said about Cuba? 
under Castro? Have you heard how much they love Cuba under Castro or Iran or China or any of these dictatorships? So there's something else going on here. So Justin Trudeau could have options. So we're in a spat with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. It was sparked by a tweet. Twitter diplomacy, which they always criticize Trump for, they say that's not the way to, ha uh, to deal with this. How could they have dealt with this? Well, they could have dealt with this through quiet diplomacy, which is what liberals always say Trump should be doing. They could have dealt with this through back channels. They could have dealt with this through meetings with ambassadors. No, they dealt with this through a tweet. That tweet, as I said, once translated into Arabic and disseminated through Saudi media, angered the kingdom, and they decided they didn't have a choice. They were going to make an example out of Canada. I'm not defending Saudi Arabia here. I have no time for Saudi Arabia. But consider this. Have any of the actions by Justin Trudeau helped Rafe Badawi, his sister Samar, who was arrested recently, or his family, who now lives in Canada? No. It hasn't helped any of them. Rafe Badawi and his sister Samar are being treated just as badly as they were a week ago. Potentially, they could be treated worse. And that's my fear. They, they could be treated worse. Justin Trudeau and Christy Freeland made this tweet. They feel good about it. They say they're not going to back down. Okay, great. You feel good about it. You're not going to back down. What are the implications for Canada? Well, Saudi Arabia has uh, called back 16,000 students. That's a big uh, financial hit to Canadian post-secondary edu uh, educational institutions. Among those 16,000, 1,000 doctors. We're not talking doctors in training. We're talking doctors, full doctors. Yeah, they're doing some additional training here, but they are full doctors. In fact, the, the man that gave me this data that it's a thousand doctors that are about to be recalled, pulled out of the Canadian medical system, people that are giving frontline treatment. The person that told me this said, last weekend in Toronto, there were three doctors at Sick Kids Hospital. This is the place that everyone takes their kids when they're in dire straits to. Three doctors in the emergency room alone were Saudis. They're all being called back. We are having all Canadian bonds, Canadian stocks, Canadian cash deposits sold off, uh, exports of wheat, other commodities cut off. All of this because they decided they didn't want to deal with Rafe Badawi, who's been in jail since 2012, through quiet diplomacy. They wanted to do it through Twitter and they wanted to tweak the nose. We are being made an example of. I get that. The response from Saudi Arabia is over the top. I get that. But the actions of Justin Trudeau and his government have to be called out. This is a guy, and I wrote about this in a column that I did up for the, the Toronto Sun. This is a guy that has annoyed and pissed off every single country he's dealt with. Think about it. China, the basic dictatorship that he most admires, they're annoyed at him. They, they, they can't stand the guy. He showed up last December to sign a free trade deal, and they left him cooling his heels. He thinks he's showing up for a free trade deal, he doesn't get one. Why? Because he's annoyed them. He had just come from Vietnam, where he was supposed to sign the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, trade deal. He didn't sign it. Why? Because he wanted to impress the Chinese, who apparently are already annoyed at him. So that annoys Australia, Japan, Brunei, all these Asian Pacific partners that we're supposed to be dealing with. He annoys all of them. He annoyed uh, Donald Trump, because after the G7, in a side meeting, Donald Trump, according to CBC, this is CBC's reporting and not mine, CBC reported that at the G7 in Charlevoix, Quebec, Donald Trump said, all right, fine, we'll make a concession on the, uh, the, the sunset clause on NAFTA. That was one of Canada's red lines. Donald Trump gives Trudeau that, then he gets on his plane, he leaves, he thinks he's got a deal, and while he's on his plane, he's watching Justin Trudeau say, we won't be pushed around by the Americans, thumping his chest in the middle of his news conference. Donald Trump freaks out, starts a Twitter tirade. Now we are in the targets of the Americans. As we're fighting with the Saudis, the UK won't stand with us. The US won't stand with us. The EU won't stand with us. The Palestinian Authority that we just gave $50 million to won't stand with us. 
Justin Trudeau is a walking international disaster. I mean, just think back to his trip in India. He had only one of the fastest growing economies in the world, the largest democracy in the world. He annoyed them with his Mr. Dress Up Tickle trunk. This guy doesn't know how to handle foreign affairs at all. So he is punting this all over the place without knowing where the ball is going to land. The, there ends my rant on Justin Trudeau in Saudi Arabia. I have no time for the kingdom. I think that they're oppressive and they're awful. But this guy sucks up to oppressive and awful regimes on a daily basis, be it China, be it Iran, be it elsewhere. And he has no problem with it. But as soon as they push back, well, now all of a sudden we've got a feminist uh, values-based foreign policy that he's got to defend. Yeah, tell that to the women in Iran that have been arrested for violating the mandatory dress policy. Has he spoken up on that? No. No, I haven't heard a damn thing from him on that. Uh, let's turn to Ontario politics for a bit. Maybe you've heard. Ontario is bringing back bucket beer, or at least they're going to allow it. And suddenly, this has set off the left in a way that I've never seen. They're actually offended that beer will be cheaper. Who doesn't like cheaper beer? Now, maybe you don't want to drink beer that costs a dollar a bottle. Maybe you think, okay, it's not very good beer. Fine, fair enough. But will you be angry if your neighbor likes that beer and wants to go drink it? You shouldn't be. You should, you know, live and let live, right? That's the way it should be. But the left is losing their collectivist little minds when it comes to bucket beer in Ontario. They're saying, why is this Doug Ford's priority? Well, it's not. It's kind of way down his list because since he came to power, he was sworn in June 29th. Uh, the legislature came to uh, sit on June 11th. They elected a speaker. They had a speech from the throne. So really around June 19th is when they, or July 19th is when they got going. Uh, let's see, what have they done since then? Well, they ended the strike at York University. They uh, started to unwind cap and trade, which will lower the price of gas. They have uh, announced that they're going to fight the Trudeau government on the carbon tax. They've announced a 100-day review of welfare and say that they will bring about reform on that. And there's a whole lot of other things, the sex ed curriculum, the math curriculum, they've said all of that's going on. They're going to review all of this. And on top of that, yeah, you can have bucket beer again. Why is this even the government's issue? It shouldn't be the government's issue, except we have what's called a floor price for beer in almost every province in this country. The government sets the minimum price. If it was up to me, the government wouldn't have anything to do with the price of beer. They wouldn't set the minimum. They wouldn't set the maximum. They'd just get the hell out of the way. But for a long time, the government of Ontario has set the minimum floor price. Back in the early 2000s, a uh, bucket beer, 24 beers for $24 in a case, was very popular. Incredibly popular. In fact, there was one brewery in Hamilton, Ontario called Lakeport, back in my hometown. Lakeport went from 1%, less than 1% actually, less than 1% of market share in Ontario for all beer sold to 11% in a couple of years. Why? Buck a beer. People wanted Lakeport. They wanted Lakeport honey. They wanted Lakeport ice. This was affordable beer. People that didn't want to spend a lot of money on beer, they could say, you know what? I can afford it. Oh, why don't you drink the craft beer? I can't afford it. It's three bucks a can. Who can afford that? Well, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You treat yourself, and the rest of the time you're drinking Lakeport honey for 24 bucks for 24 bottles. What's the problem with this? Well, Dalton McGinty and the Ontario Liberals decided this was too cheap. Why? Um, mainly because Labatt and Molson didn't like it, and they had the ear of the government. They lobbied them hard, and they convinced them to get rid of Baca beer. So they increased the minimum price. All of a sudden, $24 uh, for 24 beers is no longer a marketing gimmick. So saying $1.25 for a bottle that's not the same. It's simply not. It's not a marketing gimmick. So the price of beer went up. It's gone up since then. The Liberals since 2010 have increased the tax on beer every single year. In fact, they've pretty much come close to doubling it for craft breweries. 
and they put it up by about 50% for the, the majors, the Labats and the Molses. So all of this is going on. Doug Ford, in the middle of the election, says, we'll let people sell for plastic beer. beer. He's not going to force anyone to do it. He's not going to mandate, 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 mandate you sell, you sell, sell for, for one dollar or one dollar. He's just going to say, just gonna say you, if you want to do it, you can. And the left is angry at this. They're calling it a subsidy. There's no taxpayers' dollars going to it. Oh, but he's allowing them to get special promotional considerations from the LCBO. All right, let me fill you in on something here. The LCBO, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, this is the Ontario Liquor uh, Store, they do not sell the majority of beer in Ontario. The majority of the beer in Ontario is sold by the beer store. Now, I remember somebody coming up to visit me years ago from Quebec, and they said, where do I go get beer? And I said, go down to the, the, the plaza down the street, go to the beer store. And they said, well, what's the beer store called? I said, it's called the beer store. They thought I was joking. No, that's what it's called, because we have a monopoly that is controlled by Labatt, Molson, and Sleeman's bought in a small chunk. Now, they all sound like Canadian brewers. They're not. Labatt is controlled by InBev of Belgium. Uh, Molson is controlled by Coors out of Colorado. And Sleeman is controlled by Sapporo out of Japan. And they run the majority of the beer. You want to have shelf space there, you've got to pay them big time. You want the ability to have your product run, you got to pay them big time. What Doug Ford is saying is that in the, the provincial run liquor store, you, you might be able to get a, you know, an end cap on the end of a shelf. You might be able to get a shelf extender. You might get some promotional considerations. The LCBO doesn't sell that much beer. But everyone's freaking out that this is this is some kind of subsidy. Let me tell you, the previous wind government, they gave out millions of dollars, mostly to craft breweries. And all the people complaining about this are saying, I don't want this piss water. I want craft beer. Look, if you want craft beer, go ahead and drink it. If you want bucket beer, go ahead and drink it. Whatever beer you want, I don't care. I like all the beer. Just go ahead and drink it, whatever it is that you want. But don't be a snob and then say a promotional consideration is a subsidy, but not be outraged that there were literally millions of dollars handed over to these guys over here, and they pay a tax rate half the price of the majors. I'm just pointing that out. Oh, and, uh, and by the way, for everyone outraged that there was uh, promotional considerations given, well... Uh, Justin Trudeau handed out $150 million today to CAE. It's an aerospace company based in, oh, Quebec. Yeah, you guessed that already. $150 million directly from the taxpayer to this company. None of the people that were angry about Doug Ford giving promotional considerations in a government-run store, which isn't tax dollars, but they were angry about that. They're not angry about Justin Trudeau. That's not happening. Uh, sticking with Ontario politics just for a moment, and then I'm going to tell you about crazy, crazy uh, issues around cultural appropriation. And I think we've we've hit peak insanity. I'm not saying it can't go further, but it shouldn't go further. With Ontario politics, Doug Ford promised that he would repeal and review the sex ed curriculum. Why? Because of people like me, people that thought, you know what? This is simply not age appropriate. Um, nobody that I know is against sex ed being taught in schools. No sane person is against that being a subject discussed in schools. But is the material age appropriate? As someone with four kids who were going through the school system, yeah, you know, they're still in the school system, but when this was first proposed back in 2009, 2010, um, I looked at it and said, this is an age appropriate. Well, guess what? Dalton McGinty looked at it. He was the then liberal premier of Ontario. And he said, this is nuts. We're not going to do this. He pulled it. He retires. Kathleen Wynne steps in. She brings it back whole hog. And all of a sudden people are protesting again. Well, it became an election issue. Doug Ford said he would repeal it. They'll go back to the old curriculum, the one that was taught up until 2014, and they'll consult with parents. This is considered horrible. You can't do this. 
We're having uh, school boards protest saying we won't follow the, the government rules. Uh, they kind of have to. You've got teachers saying they won't follow the government rules. You've got uh, the NDP asking questions about it day after day. Here's the thing. The other part of the curriculum that the Doug Ford Ontario Conservative said, we're going to change, was the math curriculum. Because I don't know if you realize this, but Ontario's math curriculum is an absolute disaster. Quebec is still doing pretty well. Other provinces are still doing pretty well. But Ontario, only 50% of the kids in grade six could pass or meet the, uh, the provincial standard last year. 50% met the provincial standard. That should be worrying. That should be repealed. You know what hasn't happened? The opposition hasn't asked a single question about it. The media hasn't asked a, qu a single question about it. The school boards have never protested it. They went along with it. It has been a disaster for years. It has been on a downward trajectory like this, ticking down on a chart. Nobody's cared about it. Nobody said a thing about it. But sex ed? And you're not going to teach uh, Johnny about uh, gender fluidity in grade three? How dare you? Oh, okay, well, Johnny can't add. That's fine. But make sure he knows about gender fluidity. Make sure that he knows about uh, sexting and consent. He doesn't need to, to read or add or actually I shouldn't say read because Ontario does quite well on reading. We do quite well in literacy. We do badly in math. I'm not saying the whole school system is an abomination, but on math, we're horrible. And none of these people complained, but they're all complaining, they're protesting, they're refusing to go along with the government that funds them, and they never said a thing about this math curriculum that has been a disaster for near a decade in the province of Ontario. It is disgusting. Now, I promised you a little bit of insanity on cultural appropriation. I don't know where you stand on Rihanna. Um, you know, I don't want to work, work, work either. Uh, it's not her best song. She is a brilliant performer, brilliant artist, and she's a beautiful woman. I'm not sure about these skinny eyebrows on her, but, you know, that's just a visual thing. I look at them and I think, mm, not for me. But there is a writer at Marie Claire, the fashion magazine, that has accused Rihanna of cultural appropriation. Why? for having skinny eyebrows. Apparently she is culturally appropriating Latina culture and she's from the Caribbean, so she can't do that. Is this peak insanity or what? They are literally claiming that having your eyebrows thinner than they naturally are is only for Latinas. If they've been paying attention to women over centuries, women of all cultures who have sculpted their eyebrows into all kinds of different things, look, I don't get it. I don't understand threading. I don't get half of what women do to make themselves look good. I'm happy they do what they do to make themselves look good, but I don't understand it. But now they're claiming that Rihanna is guilty of cultural appropriation. I'm waiting for the day, quite literally, where somebody figures out who invented pants. And then all of a sudden, if you're not from that culture, Let's say Romanians invented pants. I'll just pick on Romanians. Let's say Romanians invented pants. If you're not Romanian, you can't wear pants. You got to wear a skirt. You got to wear a kilt. You got to wear who knows what, but you can't wear pants because otherwise it's cultural appropriation. We have been melding and developing as cultures and trading and exchanging ideas and thoughts and fashions and food forever. It's what human life is all about and it's wonderful and it's great and it's exciting. And now we've got to this idea in the 21st century where we're more integrated than ever that if you did not invent something, your culture did not invent something, then you can't do it. Okay. Stop speaking English. I should stop speaking English, you know, from my heritage. My people did not speak English. I don't know any other language but apparently I should stop speaking English. It is ridiculous. Cultural appropriation is nothing but Marxist Frankfurt School bullshit. And we've just got to put it aside and ignore 
these people. I wouldn't even raise it except to point out how ridiculous it is so that more people knew it existed. I'll tweet out my piece about um, the need to dump Sir Wilfrid Laurier because he was racist as well. Uh, not because I actually think we need to dump him. I think we need to acknowledge our history, the warts and all. But uh, if we're going to remove Sir John A. from Victoria, then we've got to remove Sir Wilfrid Laurier from everywhere. Uh, we've got to remove, um, who was it? There was a prime minister in the 50s, uh, Louis Saint Laurent, when they were building the Dew Line, actually wrote to the Americans and said, you can send troops uh, to build the Dew Line. This is the early warning system in case the Soviets were coming o over across the north. He said to them, uh, you can send American troops to help build this, but they can't be more than 10% Negro. It's not my word. It's in the document. You can find it. It's authentic. He didn't want more than 10% Negroes. Why? Because he was racist. He's a liberal icon. Are we going to get rid of all of them? I'm not saying this to say let's get rid of liberal icons instead of conservatives. I'm saying acknowledge our history. Anyways, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for watching tonight. Thanks for being part of this. You can listen to me on CFRA.com. I'm on again tomorrow morning from 6 a.m. until 10. I'm all over the place for the next little while. You can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Brian Lilly or facebook.com slash Brian Lilly. And thanks to the guys at The Nectarine for inviting me on, having me on tonight. All the best. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And remember, I'm on your side. Thank you.